What if humanity had continued to push deeper into the solar system, landing people on Mars with 1970s technology? The top aerospace scientists of that era believed in this possibility, and they left behind several visionary plans that could have paved the way for human colonization of Mars by the end of the 20th century. Welcome to Science with Lou, your portal to the fascinating world of space exploration and scientific history. In today's video, we embark on a journey into the realm of imagination, pondering what could have been if NASA's Apollo mission hadn't stopped at the moon. Our journey begins in the 1940s with a vision from Dr. Werner von Braun, also known as the father of rocket science and the mastermind behind NASA's Apollo program. Von Braun's early career involved redesigning ballistic missiles for the Nazi army in his native Germany, culminating in the creation of the V-2 rocket, the world's first long-range guided missile. After the war, he was recruited by the United States military and subsequently transferred to NASA, where he played a pivotal role as the director of the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. It's worth noting that many German scientists, including former Nazis, found employment in the United States during the late 1940s and early 1950s. But let's not delve into that in this video. In 1948, while he was working for the US military testing V-2 rockets, von Braun composed a 280-page novel in his spare time originally known as Das Mars Project. While the actual novel was not published until 57 years later, its appendix, a technical specification of a potential mission to Mars, was later translated to English in 1953 as the Mars Project. This technical specification outlined von Braun's ambitious plan for a crewed mission to the Red Planet, employing the rocket technology he was actively developing. Then, in 2006, the actual novel, Project Mars, a technical tale was finally published. While much of the novel reads like science fiction, it is underpinned by von Braun's insider knowledge, making it a unique blend of rocket science and storytelling. The narrative takes place in a not-so-distant future, where human society has united following a catastrophic Third World War, maintained by a massive orbital weapon ensuring world peace. This might sound like a page out of a science fiction novel, but it was penned by an actual rocket scientist with profound insight. Beyond the fiction, the later pages of the book feature formulas and calculations necessary for achieving Project Mars. Von Braun's illustrations of this ambitious plan are equally remarkable. These illustrations, awash in retro-futuristic technicolor, would go on to influence generations of science fiction from 2001, a space odyssey to Star Wars, and even Elon Musk's SpaceX ventures. According to Project Mars, the mission would begin by establishing a large-scale human presence in low Earth orbit. Gigantic ring-shaped space stations would rotate slowly, creating artificial gravity, while an orbital construction yard would serve as the hub for assembling the Mars fleet. One of von Braun's most famous rocket designs, the massive ferry rocket, served as a fully reusable space plane and booster system, shuttling materials from Earth's surface to orbital construction projects. In orbit, a colossal fleet of transportation ships, cargo haulers, and Mars landers would be assembled 1,000 miles above the Earth's surface. These ships, comprising spherical crew sections, powered by clusters of liquid-fueled rocket engines would be connected by an extensive network of fuel tanks. Von Braun favored hypergolic propellants, chemicals that ignite upon contact under pressure, simplifying rocket engine ignition in the vacuum of space. This approach is still commonly employed in modern space exploration, as exemplified by the Draco thrusters on SpaceX's Dragon capsule. Once the Mars fleet was ready, it would fire its engines to break free from Earth's gravity and set a direct trajectory for Mars, utilizing the Hohmann transfer window, 
a launch window that occurs every 26 months for a mission between Earth and Mars in order to achieve the energy-efficient orbital transfer between the two planets. According to von Braun's vision, the journey would last 260 days, or eight and a half months, culminating in Mars orbit. Approaching Mars, the ships would turn around, firing their engines once more to reduce velocity and establish a low orbit around the planet, just 620 miles above its surface. From this point, Mars lander vehicles would detach from their main engines and fuel tanks in preparation for landing. In von Braun's estimation, these vehicles would function as gliders in the Martian atmosphere, enabling a controlled, gentle touchdown on the planet's surface. Upon landing, the main vehicle would detach its glider wings, bringing the crew to the Martian surface. The crew would establish the first human colony on Mars using supplies delivered by the massive lander vehicle. After completing their mission, the vertical rockets would blast off from the surface, rejoining the waiting fleet in orbit. The crew would then return to their transport ships, and the fleet would execute a rocket engine burn to establish a return trajectory for Earth. While this plan seemed entirely feasible to well-informed rocket scientists of the late 1940s, it had one critical flaw, a lack of knowledge about the Martian environment. Von Braun's assumptions about ancient canals, lush vegetation, lakes, and even advanced alien civilizations on Mars turned out to be incorrect. Additionally, Mars possesses virtually no atmosphere, less than 1% of Earth's density, rendering von Braun's glider-winged rocket plane unsuitable for the task. Moving on to the 1950s, a refined plan for human spaceflight to Mars was taking shape. The era witnessed the dawn of the atomic age, with nuclear energy harnessed to generate electricity, inspiring hopes for unlimited energy that could fuel deep space exploration. Among those exploring the potential of nuclear power for space travel was atomic scientist Dr. Ernst Stuhlinger, a close colleague of Werner von Braun and a former Nazi scientist turned U.S. government asset. Stuhlinger's vision updated von Braun's Project Mars for the atomic age, replacing hypergolic chemical rocket ships with nuclear electric spacecraft. His Mars plan gained such recognition that it was featured on American TV in 1957. Walt Disney, known for his weekly television program Disneyland, dedicated an episode titled Mars and Beyond to exploring the planets of the solar system. In a segment presented by von Braun and Stuhlinger, they showcased models and illustrations of Stuhlinger's atomic electric Mars transport, outlining the human journey to Mars. This illustration was part of Disney's effort to depict the wonders of the solar system, offering creative speculations on the appearance of aliens from Mercury, Mars, and Venus. Stuhlinger's spacecraft concept was considerably larger than von Braun's and featured a nuclear reactor, which generated thermal energy. This heat transformed silicon oil into steam, which in turn powered a turbine generator producing electricity for the entire craft. The exhaust steam was condensed and recycled within the atomic generator. The main engine, situated in the middle of the ship, employed a platinum metal grid, ionizing cesium atoms to generate thrust. While the thrust generated was relatively low, the efficiency of the electrical engine allowed it to operate continuously throughout the mission. This concept closely resembles the ion thrusters used in modern space probes and satellites. The spacecraft had separate sections for cargo and crew quarters. The landing on Mars involved deploying a giant parachute and then firing the descent engines for a soft touchdown, following which the main body of the vehicle would return to the fleet in orbit. This design represented a significant improvement over von Braun's plan and offered a more realistic approach to Mars exploration. In the 1960s, NASA was reaching new heights in human spaceflight. Mercury and Gemini missions had successfully sent astronauts into space, achieved orbital velocity, and conducted extravehicular spacewalks. 
the Apollo program, led by Werner von Braun, was progressing rapidly, with the Saturn Fuff rocket nearing completion, poised to land the first humans on the moon and return them safely. NASA's attention shifted beyond Apollo, with aspirations to send people to Mars in the early 1980s. This ambition sparked a wave of Mars mission proposals from various quarters, including surprising candidates like the Ford Motor Company. Among these proposals, Boeing Aerospace's 1968 white paper stood out as a legitimate mission design originating from a company deeply entrenched in spaceflight. Boeing introduced a nuclear thermal rocket propulsion stage, a different concept compared to the nuclear electric ion thruster we discussed earlier. This technology, while based on nuclear fission, utilized a different approach. Liquid hydrogen fuel, cryogenically cooled to ultra-low temperatures, was pumped into the red-hot nuclear reactor core. This process transformed hydrogen into a low-density gas, which was then expelled as exhaust through the engine nozzle, generating thrust. In essence, this concept combined the advantages of both conventional rocket engines and electric ion thrusters, offering an ideal blend of thrust and efficiency. The Boeing interplanetary spacecraft design addressed one of the key challenges of Mars missions, transit time. Calculations indicated that it would take fewer than 200 days to reach Mars orbit. However, the return journey was significantly longer due to the majority of propellant being expended on the outbound trip. The total travel time for a round trip to Mars was estimated to be around 600 days, depending on the specific launch window. The spacecraft was to be assembled in Earth orbit, requiring multiple launches of Saturn V rockets, each equipped with four additional side boosters. The majority of the structure was devoted to engines and fuel tanks, with the upper section containing the crew modules. The mission modules served as the primary crew quarters, accommodating a team of six astronauts. At the top of the stack was the Mars Excursion Module, comprising a descent stage for landing and an ascent stage for returning to the main spacecraft. The Mars Excursion Module was designed to support a crew of three for a 30-day exploration of the Martian surface. At the bottom of the stack was the Earth Entry Module, exclusively responsible for returning the full crew of six to Earth, featuring a heat shield and parachute system for a splashdown landing in the ocean. The mission profile began with a massive departure burn from the first stage engines, consisting of three nuclear propulsion modules firing in unison. This burn provided the necessary thrust to reach Mars quickly. Upon nearing Mars, the spacecraft would execute a burn from the second stage nuclear propulsion module, facilitating orbital insertion. Subsequently, the three-person landing party would transfer to the Mars Excursion Module and separate from the main spacecraft. The Mars Excursion Module would perform a deorbit burn, enter the Martian atmosphere, deploy a main parachute for deceleration, and initiate a landing burn for a gentle touchdown on the Martian surface. After a 30-day mission on Mars, the crew would return in the Ascent Module, using four side boosters to leave the surface and rendezvous with the main spacecraft. The final nuclear engine burn would set the course for the return to Earth. Upon arrival, the Earth Entry Module would separate from the main spacecraft, re-enter Earth's atmosphere, and execute a splashdown landing in the ocean. While these plans seemed promising, they never came to fruition. The late 1960s brought numerous challenges to NASA, with shifting political landscapes, waning public interest in space exploration, and limited budget allocations. President Richard Nixon was faced with a crucial decision. Whether to expand the Apollo program to include Mars exploration or develop the Space Shuttle program. He chose the latter, signaling a shift away from ambitious lunar and Martian missions. The dream of sending humans to Mars, as outlined in these plans, remained unfulfilled. However, the visionary ideas, technological innovations and scientific progress made during this era 
paved the way for future space exploration endeavors. As we conclude our exploration of these retro-futuristic missions to Mars, we invite you to like this video if you found it fascinating and subscribe to Science with Lou for more captivating content. Our channel delves into the captivating worlds of space exploration and scientific history. Stay tuned for weekly updates on the aerospace industry and interstellar exploration. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the past, exploring the dreams and aspirations that could have led us to Mars. While we may not have landed humans on the Red Planet in the 20th century, the quest for knowledge and the spirit of exploration continue to drive us toward new frontiers in the 21st century. Remember to subscribe to Science with Lou for more exciting content, and don't forget to hit the like button to show your support. Your engagement makes a real difference. Stay curious and keep exploring the mysteries of our universe. Thank you for being a part of our scientific journey.